My husband doesn't like to look like Sunnah Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam including he doesn't want a beard. Please give me some advice. This was something This is something that we failed to mention in our talk. And that is it is possible that the Sunnah is wajib. The Sunnah is wajib. Like the beard. The beard is something that's wajib, not permissible for the man to cut it. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam ordered the men to keep it and he prevented them from cutting it and he told us to be different from the Jews who cut their beards and keep their mustaches. So we say to that sister that she should continue to not hassle him but give him advice, go to people who he respects and he wouldn't mind her talking to those people, telling them what her situation is so that they can talk to the brother. But I'm sure every sophisticated, successful married woman she is Mahira. She's an expert at knowing how to push the right buttons on her husband. The intelligent woman, she knows how to push the right buttons. She can get almost anything she wants from him. At first when she wants a pair of shoes, he says no. But if she really wants those shoes, she knows what buttons to push. She just has to go about it with her sophistication and her intelligence and her creativity. She may need these issues like the beard. Sometimes I get lazy and pleasing my husband, how can I change this? Uh, it's natural for people to get lazy and ibadah to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala even. So the Prophet told us sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that every action has its time of activity and inactivity. So whoever's time of inactivity is in accordance with his sunnah, he has been guided. And whoever his time of inactivity, of laziness, is in accordance to the sunnah, then you have those people who will be destroying their astray. So the fact that a person can become lazy in his worship is clearly acceptable and understandable that he become lazy with giving other people his rights. We have to just work ourselves out of that rut and just try to make sure that we don't find ourselves being lazy in the right of the man. That thing that is his right, you can't be lazy concerning those things especially. So we have to make an effort to fight ourselves to fight out of that problem. What is the sunnah? Shukran uh, What is the proper sunnah when one gets to the mosque and there is only a few minutes for the two akas? Do you pray for Yatul Masjid or sunnah or Qabliya or the sunnah Qabliya? The person has the real niyyah and he knows that he's not going to be able to complete even the ruqah. Well, why he's going to get his reward for his intention. But if he fails, there's a little bit of time, go ahead and try to get what you can get. You better get your intention from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But we want to warn the people, those people who let the salat begin and then they don't join the salat and they go off in the corner to pray the two rakats of the fajr while the imam and the people are praying. You're sinning at this time and that's haram and you're disobeying Abu Qasim sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sallam. No, no, no. no. Shukran. You said, Akhi, that you loved your mother who was a kafir, as you said, as you said, so how is this when she's a disbeliever? When those companions came to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and they asked the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Ya Rasulullah min ahabbu nas ilayka qala abu uh, Aisha qalu nuridu min al-rijal qala ibn abuha abu Bakr. They came to him and they said Ya Rasulullah who's the most beloved person to you from his companions? He said Aisha. They said no we're talking about the men. He said then her daughter, uh, her, her father Abu Bakr. The Messenger of Allah had 11 wives, brothers and sisters. Was it possible for him to love each one equally? Of course not. He loved Aisha more than anyone. Even though Zainab used to be in competition with Aisha because of her beauty and her piety. Aisha said, I didn't have a problem with any of his wives as far as competition was concerned except Zainab. 
because she was beautiful and she was religious. She was a person who fasted and she was a person who stood in salah and so forth and so on. So why didn't he love all of them equal? The reason is because a man doesn't have the ability to control that. You like ketchup, I like mustard. You like purple, I like red. We don't have the ability to control those issues. Now, a man has a mother who carries him around for nine months. When she was sleeping, and she was deep in a dream, out of nowhere that child just kicked her in her stomach. She jumped up, and she went back to sleep with no complaint. She vomited when he was conceived. When there was no one to take care of him when he was young, that mother took care of that child. She didn't abandon him. And then Allah guides that child to al Islam and says to that boy, Get on your mother, hate your mother. What kind of understanding is that? Allah Ta'ala has allowed the Muslim man to marry a woman from Ahlul Kitab. When you marry a woman from Ahlul Kitab, who is a muhtana, she's a good woman, you marry her, it is understood that you're going to love your wife, who's a non-Muslim. The nikah with the woman is going to mean that there's room, you can love her. She's a non-Muslim. Have you brothers and sisters not read the hadith or the ayat of the Qur'an, إِنَّكَ لَا تَهْدِي مَنْ أَحْبَبْتَ وَلَكِنَّ اللَّهَ يَهْدِي مَنْ يَشَاءَ you people, you don't guide who you love, Ya Muhammad, but Allah guides whether he chooses this ayat with the ittifaq of the scholars of al Islam. This ayat was revealed concerning the uncle of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. When his uncle decided to die on kufr, all he had to do was say la ilaha illallah. He chose the religion of Abdul Muttala and the rest of, of the rest of the bad friends that he had. No I'm gonna die on their religion. It made the Prophet sad. It made him sad. Why? Because he loved his uncle. And the iron is clear. Verily, you don't die those who you love. So what were you going to tell me? That I need to hate my mother? On top of that, I have to make this perfectly clear because I never like to let this opportunity pass me by. My mother and my father, Jazahumullahu khaira, Allah yahdihim in al haq Both of them took care of their family until their family became mature and they put them out in the world and we had to just deal with the situation. And I have an immense love and respect for my mother. Well, why I hate her kufr? And if she was to die like that, I know I'll cry. It'll be very difficult, honey. It'll be extremely difficult. If someone came, one of you people, if you came to me and you said, Abu Usama, your mother is a prostitute. Your mother is having relationships with people. Wallahi la adhabanna bika ila sama. Wallahi al azim. La aqtulanna ka qatlan. La aqtuluka nihaiyan. Wa la kana adrubanna ka darban. If you said that, if, not you said that, not you said that. If you said that about my mother, Wallahi I'll deal with you. Wallahi al azim. I may transgress the limits that Allah ordained, killing somebody. Well, why I may kill that man? I'm as serious as a heart attack. Now, if I feel that way about my mother, who's a Catholic woman, what about the wives of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam? Those people who the Prophet who Allah Taala said about them, and Nabiyu awla bil mu'minina min anfusihim. The Prophet is closer to the believers in their own selves. He wants good for us. He wants the sisters to dress right. He wants us to have good families. He wants us to take care of our kids. He wants us to be independent. He wants so much. He hates for any evil to befall us. And his wives are their mothers. During the Khilaf of Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, after the death of the Prophet some of the wives were about to go make Hajj with Abu Bakr. Abu Bakr had been allowed to call out to the people and he had the people to say, listen, this is the Hawadish, you know, the canopy that the wives of the Prophet were riding in. He said, these are the canopies of the wives of the Messenger of Allah. Anyone comes close to us, we're going to deal with you. Give them room. Let them go around the Kaaba and make tawaf. When 
Maymuna died, and it's Ibn Malik radiallahu anhu, in Sahih al-Bukhari, in the book of Al-Janaza, and it's radiallahu anhu said to the people, when they were lowering her body in the grave, don't shake her grave, don't shake her corpse, and put her in gently. That's how they used to respect them in life and in death. They used to go to the wives of the Prophet to ask questions and say, Ya Umm al-Mu'mineen, O mother of the believer. Now, if I feel like that about my mother, who if she dies and when she's a pie, she's from the Ashab al how, how how you think I'm going to feel about someone who says that when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to go to make the jihad, Aisha used to open up the back door to let the Jews come in and have relationships with her. What do you think I'm going to do to that person? Wallahi, I won't see him as being my brother. No way in the world imaginable that he can be my brother. You curse my mother, who Allah is pleased with. When your imam comes back, he's going to raise Aisha out of the grave and establish the hunt on Aisha. Wallahi, you are kidnapped. So our position concerning those people shouldn't be. All of the spokes on the wheel lead to the sinner. That's a lie as it relates to the religion. And that's our Islam. And we say that and we don't care what the ramifications are. So, with that being the case, brothers and sisters of Islam, if you are a revert to this religion, don't be tricked by shaitan who comes in all of those funny colors, making you think those crazy thoughts that are not consistent with al -Islam. Those brothers from Toronto are some, uh, consider my companions. When I go back to Orlando, they have some of their jama in Orlando. Every time I come to Toronto, those brothers give me all that king and food. Allah, they make me feel honored. They brought me a gift today. They gave me the Quran. Sheikh al muhaytin Jazahumullah khairan. Now, if someone wants to know about Abu Usama, you want to marry Abu Usama? Then ask about the company he keeps. They're going to give you an indication of what, what he's about. So how is it possible that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is going to be married to women who act like that? And he's the prophet. He's going to have as his companions men who left Islam, who conspired, they schemed and they scanized. He's going to marry his daughter to disbelievers. Wallahi, when you make those statements and you believe in that, you are in fact talking bad about the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. Is it fair to the sisters who have no husbands, but they want to marry, but the sisters don't want their husbands to have more than one wife, what's your advice to the men and the women? Well then, the issue of plural marriage is not an easy issue, and the people are dealing with their hawa concerns. On the one end, you have the brothers with the hawa, and they only think about one thing concerning plural marriage, and it's more than that. How is it possible, Ya Abdullah, that you're going to get a second wife and you're already working from nine to five? After you get up for work at 5 o'clock and you punch out, you get home at 6 o'clock. You eat the dinner, and next thing you know, you're in the bed, sleep, snoring. You sit down on your chair and you're snoring. Your wife, she doesn't have any rights. That's one wife. She's complaining. You're always sleeping, Yaki. What do you think I got married for? There's no numbness in this time. I'm, where, where, where were my rights at? And then he comes and he says, you know, there's a new sister. I think I want to get married to her. Yeah, see, where are you going to find a time? Nine to five, you MIA with the one wife. Now you're going to have double trouble. <laughs> so, poor marriage is for everyone. Not for everyone. Finances, and you don't have to have a lot of money. But right now, some of you are paying rent. $400, $500. All right, you have two houses now. $1,000. A grand. On top of that, gas, electric, food, clothes, all of that. But that's the easy thing. The finances are easy. We have some women, they're willing and they're ready to live with you anywhere you go in a cardboard box. They're ready. They want to practice this life. But the man is not a level mentally. He's emotional. He's always arguing with them. When those women start getting crazy, the poor life, he doesn't know what to do. He can't put his foot down and then people know when to be quiet. Everyone's wife, she's going to, after getting used to her husband, she's going to say something. But then there's the type of brother who say, okay, that's the last word. Now she's crying. She knows, okay, you're at that point right now. She doesn't have anything to say after that. There's some men, he can't say anything. They're always fighting, and the woman hitting the man. So that's the hua. On the woman's part, she's threatened. She has inferiority complexes. 
she has insecurities. Well, why? If the girl just knew how to push the button, whether she the first wife or the second wife, she could be the most beloved wife. All she has to do is use her wisdom to take advantage of the behavior of the other people. So those of you who have the ability to get married like that, get in the second wife, inshallah, we tell you, don't destroy your first family because of this. And it doesn't mean that the sister doesn't love his time. No, if you want to entertain getting another wife, don't do it in secret and let it come out and she find about it from the other women. From the character floor is that the women, they talk a lot. And with this internet and this computer, you have, a, you have well, why? all the eyes are against you. Don't do it undercover. You can't do it on a download. You have to be a man. Grab the bull by the horn and say, okay, look, I've been taking care of you. I have some extra money. My job is like this. There's a sister and she does it like that, like that. And this is what I'm going to do. But that's why it's important, your Akhi, that when you first marry the first girl, you got to marry a girl who loves Allah and his messenger. You can't marry a girl who's going to put you in debt as soon as you get married because she want a $3,000 bedroom set. You can't marry her. What do you think her position is going to be when you want to take another wife? She ain't going to be cooperative, for sure. So let us approach that issue, inshallah, with some hikmah. Abu Hanifa, rahmatullahi alayhi, his position about music is that you should go to the listener's house and break the music instrument because it's applied to today. Barakallahu fi. Hey, now, inshallah, if you have the sofa over that person, authority. You have authority over that person, that's your sister's house, she listens to music, you have authority over her, you can do it. But no, we have to ask this concerning these issues. You know that the Prophet said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, if one of you is walking down the street, then make the kafir who's coming down the other street go to the other side of the street. That's Islam, that's the Sunnah. Now what are you going to do, Ya Abdullah, at 155 pounds? And the kafir is 250 pounds. You want to practice that hadith? No, you have to have some sip. You have to have some understanding. Don't throw yourself to destruction. Oh, I thought that was Canadian money. That looked like Canadian money right there. <laughs> what is the adaba as one of the signs of the day of Qiyama? Al adaba. La nafhamani al adaba. Naam? Huh? Al daba. Mm. The daba is a big humongous animal who's front and his back, you can't tell the difference between the two. They both look the same. The companion of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam by the name of Samim al-Dari, he saw the Daba with some of his companions and he came to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and he told the Prophet that he saw him and he also saw the Dajjah who was tied up at that time. And he was asking that the Prophet of Islam, did the Prophet come yet? In Medina and so forth and so on. The person said, I love you, Akhi, brother, Abu Usama. Abu Usama, not Usama. My boy is Usama. Abu Usama. Thank you very much and Allah bless you. Can you please tell us of how you became a Muslim? Well, like, unlike my beloved brother, Abdul Rahim Green, who I have a tremendous amount of love and respect for, he used to take people who were reversed to Islam and he would sit you in front of the camera and he said, okay, Aki, how did you become a Muslim? And he start asking you questions. My situation is a situation where I can't go into because if the authorities came to know about some of the things, I'll, 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 I'll have some serious problems. So we're going to leave that, inshallah, in the ilm al in the unknown as a religion. What's the translation of Al-Ghuraba? Al-Ghuraba are the strangers. The strangers. The people who are doing things and people look at them and they find their behavior strange even though what they're doing is right and it's correct. It's like the girl whose family, the girl's family, the women of that family don't dress properly. No, you break it. The women, they don't dress properly. They want me to break it in half. That's a lot. It's cut in knot. What will be shut the tongue? 
that boy is on a Sunday, inshallah. Clear the hellfire even with half of a date. The woman, she comes to Al Islam and she comes from a family, they're not dressing properly, then she puts on the niqab. When she goes to a family reunion, she doesn't shake hands with her cousins, she doesn't mix with the people like that. So they look at her as being a troublemaker, they look at her as not being, something is wrong with her as a stranger. That's the Quran, and they have some special statements. We almost done it here, inshallah. If some people mix Muslim songs with hip hop, is that a bid'ah? <laughs> Concerning the issue of mixing Muslim songs with hip hop, one of the signs of the hour that people do this, that the drinking of intoxicants will be consumed and people will partake in it and then they'll call the intoxicant other than its name they'll call it spirit they'll call it feel good juice they'll call it whatever they call it but the changing of the name the changing of the name doesn't change the ruling and the evil of it so it's similar to what we said Allahu Akbar it's similar, take it easy with my man Muhammad, they're okay. The issue of the Allahu Akbar in one ear and the other Allahu Akbar in the other ear, it doesn't change the situation, it's still not permissible. So hip hop is the same way. Now, what about the issue of anashi? You know those, you want to make a poem about, you want to teach your children something like anashi. I don't know how you say it, they have it in Arabic, anashi. You want to teach your children about the pillars of Islam, like what's his name, Yusuf Islam did some of those things. Uh, what about doing that in order to teach the people, the children, you have your child and you say to your child who put your head on your shoulder straight, Allah did who made the corn for your cornflakes, Allah did who gave you the syrup for your pancakes. Allah did, and you say that kind of stuff, and your child is learning through this, inshallah that's no problem. But when that child gets old, we have to start teaching the child fiqh of al Islam. Teach them the religion. And don't let a grown person just see the way that he gets at the fiqh in the religion. It's amazing that we have some jamaat, you get them singing all of these songs, and then you ask the people basic religion, basic questions about the religion, and they don't even know about it. No, we don't get fiqh based upon those things. Hip hop is Haram. Is it haram to celebrate the Prophet's birthday? Yes. Is it haram to say to a person, a person is your champion? Yeah, you can say a person is your champion. You say to the person, listen, I have a problem with that brother so and so. Would you go over there and champion my cause? Linguistically, there's nothing wrong with that. Yahi. Is it okay to wear a platform with jilbab and hijab? I believe platform are those high heel shoes. The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam told us about the evil women from Bani Israel who used to take for themselves and khashab to make themselves look taller, taller and more appealing and more attractive. Allah Ta'ala told us in the Quran in the order for Muslim women وَقَرْنَ فِي بُيُوتِ كُنَّا وَلَا تَبَرَّجْنَا تَبَرَّجِ الْجَاهِلِيَةِ الْأُولَى You women should stay in your home and not make the form of display at the time of Jahiliyyah. How was it displaying Jahiliyyah? She used to go out with bangles on her ankle. When she walked, she walked in a seductive way. And she used to switch and she would walk to stop her feet to make men look and become interested in her. So now the woman, she has platforms and she's walking down the street. Kalak, 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 kalak. And everyone is here her before she gets there by so many meters. That's not from the adab of Al-Islam. So the woman in Al-Islam, she knows before she even purchases the shoes, she knows. There's some Islamic etiquette that I have to observe. She gets nice, comfortable shoes. Another thing, sisters in Al-Islam, it's ridiculous, I'm telling you. It doesn't make sense for some of us to allow ourselves to be subjected to the narrow-minded trendsetters in the fashion world. Some of the shoes that they make for women, they're no good for your feet. They're no good for your calves. They're no good for your hips. 
and people suffer after that in their later years from arthritis, premature arthritis, bunions on your toes, corns on your toes, all kind of problems, physical problems, only to say to the, to, to, to the child to follow some train that these are saying. So those platform shoes, if they're those big ones that make that noise, we should stay away from it. Is it against the religion to be in a sport such as basketball? No. Basketball is one of the best sports you can possibly partake in. And it helps a man to be a mujahid. He just can't wear shorts. He just can't do all those external factors that make it haram. That's all. What's wrong with basketball? I told you the 77 year old man went up into space. One of the signs of the hour is that people from this ummah will have big stomachs. They're men. You look at the Muslim man today, he can't do anything. He eats too much grease. He eats too much fat. He's out of shape. He does no exercises. No soccer, no basketball, no working out, no anything. He does nothing about taking care of his body. Now you have this 77 year old Catholic going out of space. Do you know the impact that going out of space has on a person's body? How they have found that your chest expands, your thighs and your legs shrink, your blood becomes thickened out, all kind of stuff happens to you. But yet, that old man had the ability to go and he was robust in going out. Now the young Muslim man at 32, 29, he can't run from here to the car in the cold. Once he gets to the door, he's breathing, he can't hardly breathe because he eats too much fat, too much grease. No, this is not the way. So basketball is a good thing. What's the problem? The problem is when we look at Michael Jordan as a god, when we look at those people as our examples, as our heroes, this is the problem. There's interest and GST haram or halal. What is GST? Huh? What? I can't even remember. Goods and services tax. I say if people can get away from paying taxes without pay, putting a problem on yourself, if you can get around it, then get around it. If you can get around it, then get around it. If you can't get around it, then out of necessity you have to give them what they are taking from you oppressive. As for interest, interest is haram, clearly. <laughs> Is it allowed for us to get donations from Kufa when they are celebrating some things like Christmas? They're giving it to you because of that? Yes, you can't take it from your job or your relative. The Imam Muslim related to Prophet Hadith, the one who innovates a good innovation in Islam has its reward and the reward of those who will practice it until the day of judgment without any less rewards of those who practice it. The one who innovated a bad innovation in Islam has its sin and the sin of those who will practice with it until the day of judgment without lesser of those practices. Imam Muslim and Bukhari relates the Prophet Hadith, he said, If anyone innovates in our religion or in our matter which does not belong to it, then it is rejected. There's not a real question here, I think. I'm not going to create a question. It wasn't a question. They tell us this hadith and that hadith, and both of them are authentic. Whoever innovates in the religion, it will be rejected when they innovate in the religion. The other one talking about whether innovates are good. Whoever invents a good bid'ah, he'll get the reward. Whoever do a bad bid'ah, he'll get the punishment without the people's reward and punishment being decreased. The meaning of that is they, in, they are the reason why people come to do something else that's already established in the, in the religion. Is G-A-D haram? If it is, explain why. Is khuruj bid'ah? G-A-D is the same thing as G-S-T? Oh, I think they're saying qa. Qa. Yeah, yeah. Qa is haram. It puts you in a, in a utopia to make you feel good. I've been to some of the Muslim countries, many of the Muslim countries, where they eat cock and the men sit down and talk like women. <laughs> they sit down and they rock back and forth, drinking tea, and their mouth get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And then when they take it out, the spit, you say, Ah, you got all out of your mouth. Allah is. It's too power. That's not from the maru'ah of a man. 
In Al Islam, we have a thing called the Mura'a. A man being a man. You see these little boys coming here? My student, I mean, there are certain things I expect from my boy here. Because he's still young, immature, not fully developed. But there's a type of brother who's 25, he's 24. He comes to me, wants to marry my daughter. I look at him and I say, no nah, man, you're still immature. You, not, you have to sharpen up your sword before you can get my daughter. You still got some things to do because you're not a man yet. al Muru'a, something that the Muslims got away from now. al Imam Malik, Rahmatullahi Alayhi, he would not accept the witness of a man who didn't keep his head covered. If a man came and you had a complaint against someone else in the court of an Imam Malik, when you came to the sheikh, an Imam Malik would say, who, who do you have as a witness? I say, that brother, yeah, Imam Malik, if he didn't have something on his head, an Imam Malik would say, he has no ajala. He has no ajala. He's not a person who I can take his witness. Not to mention a man who cut his beard. Well, why you did not show up in the Islamic court yesterday being without a beard? Aibun kabir, kabir, kabir. Aibun. Amrun la yutafouk. Well, why y'all don't say that at once so you want to look at me upset? All of you are my brothers in Al-Islam. Yeah, Sheikh, let me get some help there now. All of you are my brothers in Islam. I'm just explaining to you what the situation But this is how far we got away from the people who left for us this religion. So now the man is sitting in Al-Islam they would never, ever, ever respect the student of knowledge who's sitting in the, in the dhuls, eating in the street. Eating, laughing with his mouth out loud in the street. What about the man now? He wants to teach. He's a student of knowledge. He sits there like we had. You know, when we went to Medina, many of us were going with the luggage of America, the West. We need to be taught. We were brand new to Islam. We used to go to Medina and you would see the students sitting there chewing bubble gum, making bubbles in front of the teacher. So the teacher that was amazing. What's wrong with you? What are you here for? They had to get used to the behavior of the people coming from the West. The person, we would sit there in a chair like this with our, face, with our feet up like this. The sheikh would keep doing like this. And we used to think, man, you're going overboard. The sheikh going overboard. I'm not trying to disrespect the sheikh by sitting like this. It's just comfortable. You know, you're intellectual and you try to sit like this. The sheikh used to hate those kind of people. We see the young brothers now sitting in the lesson with the sheikh. They have both their feet out towards the sheikh or towards the qibla. An uh, old man, he still, he's just a regular good person. He comes to me and says, respect the qibla, yaqi. Don't put your feet towards the qibla. The man who's on a sunnah, he says to that person, you got a hadith to show them? Is that from the sunnah? You don't have no hadith. Yaqi, the man respects the qibla. Don't you know we've been prevented from sitting towards the Qibla? From going to the bathroom towards the Qibla facing it or being turned back from it? What are you talking about? That's where he's coming from. He's still on the Fitra. What are you talking about? So clearly, cops get you high. For sure. I've seen it with my own high. And I know people when they high. I know. <laughs> Is it allowed to use poetry in English? to spread the Tao of Islam to the youth and say, for an example, but without musical sounds. Poetry is nice, even in English. Poetry is nice. As long as you don't go overboard like the Shu'ara. The Shu'ara of the Arabs, the poets, they used to go overboard. And they used to describe themselves more than what they were really, the reality of the situation. Now we're not going to accept any more questions, inshallah. Is it against Islam to become friends with a non-Muslim? Not against Islam to become a friend with a non-Muslim to give them dawah. Just don't compromise the religion. Is it permissible to eat from the meat, the meat which was killed by non-Muslims? The issue of ikhtilaf. The people are clearly from Ahlul Kitab and they say Bismillah. Then you say Bismillah over the meat. But we don't see eating at McDonald's. We don't see going to the restaurant. We don't see going to the supermarket, to the supermarket and buying that meat as being the meat of the people of the book. Chinese people go to places and all kind of people own them. Buddhists and Hindus and all kind of stuff. Now it brings us to the next issue. Leave alone that which you doubt, but that which you don't doubt. I recognize that some of our respected scholars 
of the opinion like Sheikh Ibn Uthaymeen that you can just eat their meat because this is the place of Ahl al-Kitab. I recognize that. We recognize that. But we say, brothers and sisters, leave alone what you doubt for that which you don't doubt. Go and give your money to Abdullah, the Jazar. Go and give your money to the Muslims and keep our money in our own community. Why give the money to the Kuffar? When you finance a home or a car, it is considered interest that you are paying. Is it haram? Yes, all these are haram. It's haram. Why can't you go and get a car, Yaqi, for whatever you have? All you have is 2,000, 3,000. Continue to save. Continue to save. Get a car, six, seven thousand. 7,000. Continue to save. And then whatever you have, Allah is going to help you to get a nice car. It's going to be reliable and dependent. Now you go get a car that you have to lease or you get it on finance or whatever, whatever. You're involved with that riba. And even though it gets you to and fro, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not pleased with that action. You're driving a car, it's a problem for you. The hadith about a veil in the front of the one who did bid'ah. Where can I find the narration for my notes? Jazakallah khaira. I don't remember the exact place of the hadith, but if you go to the book, uh, al Jami al Sagheer, the Shaykh Nasir al-Din al-Albani, that he did from the book of Al-Imam al-Suyuti, rahmatullahi alayhi, you'll find it, you can get it from the chapter of Ali. إن الله احتجز التوبة عن صاحب البدعة. You can also find that hadith in the book Kitab al-Sunnah by Imam Ibn Abi Asim. If you had that, I know that it's there. But that's not from the Ummu Hat of the Kutub that you make the takhrij of the hadith like that. But that's where the Sheikh will tell you where you can get it. If a woman who wears niqab and the hijab, if she has to meet. If it, uh, he has to meet my husband's family for the first time, should I at least remove my niqab just for my husband and, and his family to see and know me? I mean, my brother-in-law and my sister. Hey, how you gonna go to your? How you gonna go to your husband's house? How is the brother going to take his wife to his mother and father's house and create problems for them to understand the religion? She can't, all of, already they have a problem, they're uncomfortable with the veil. Unless you have mothers like my mother, fathers like my father, just open minded, do your own thing, it's alright, just be your own person, it's alright, just don't hurt people, it's okay. Most people are not like that. You're gonna go to them say, she, they say, look, I'm your, I'm your, they have a, they can't understand that. When I came back from Medina and I started giving talks, my mother used to come and support me at the talks in East Orange, New Jersey. She used to come and sit in the part designated for the kuffar to listen in support of her son. Wallahi, my mother was coming closer and closer to Islam. She used to tell me, I know Islam is the truth because if it could change you, it could change anybody. Her problem was, she just didn't want to get with the program. She told me I know Islam is the truth. So I was working on my mother little bit by little bit, trying to honor her. My mother, she got halal meat in the freezer right now. You come with me to my house, right, today, anytime. My mother got halal meat ready for me. I took her one time to East Orange, New Jersey. There was a sister who started talking to my mother, and she asked my mother, Hey, you married? My mother said, Yeah, I'm married. I got a good husband. Been with me all these years, 20 some years. Well, you know if you become a Muslim now, Miss Maney, you know you have to divorce that man because he's a Catholic. My mother said, I'm not accepting no religion that tell me I got to divorce my husband. My husband is a good man. My husband been on it, and my mother just went through her thing. She said she didn't want to hear about it. When I came, she asked me, look, you ain't never told me about this. Is this true in the religion? Ma, I don't worry about that, ma. We're going to tell you something like that. Ma, that ain't important. You believe in Allah, you got to believe in God. Uh, she don't want to hear that. Is that true in this religion? Oh, yeah, ma, it's true. So I don't want to be a Muslim then. Now, you see what the girl created for me? That's my mother. She's not a Muslim now. Why? Because someone introduced to my mother that which could have been kept quiet right now. A tawheed. A tawheed. That's what we got to deal with right now. Let her believe in Allah and all that. And, and Allah and in her relationship to Allah. Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam his job is wavifa. Then after that, we start introducing all that other stuff. He's an alcoholic. He's doing something. Take it easy. Take it easy. Let them believe in Allah. Don't introduce all of that. So how are we going to go to our homes like this? And you're wearing a niqab and they can't see you. First of all, what, what, what's the proof they can't see your face? What's the proof? And you're going to make a problem for them. 
we have too many examples of this. Wallahi, this is a fiqh and a faham that is saqeen. It is sick, crazy. Those brothers, and you know some of them, they accept Islam and they break up the pictures in their mother's house. Yeah, see, that's not your property. Yeah, but the malaika, the malaika, go get your own house, man. <laughs> and then deal with the malaika. How you gonna do that? They love, they love the dog. The mother got a dog. The dog's been in the family for 10 years. They spend money on that dog. He put the dog in the car, go to the park, let the dog out, run away. <laughs> the malaika, the malaika. <laughs> All right, I ain't, I'm not telling you guys this to make you laugh. I have no situations like this. It's like today's kafar, you took a person from the family and you put them outside like that. Don't so create a fitna. Is it haram to say a bad word to a Muslim? No, nah, no, nah, we shouldn't say bad words to the Muslim and make them feel bad. Are you talking to us about sunnah and faru? I would like to know what the consequences are, if any, if one is not performing various acts of sunnah. For an example, praying sunnah after or before the salah, not growing a beard, is obligatory. Not sunnah, lengthening the pants. It's obligatory to keep your pants above your ankles. Like it, who like it? Hate it, who hate it? Walking around in this society, Muslim, it's against Islam, and it's the major sense. The companion came to the Prophet وسلم, and his fold was below his pants. Rasulullah said, Ma tahtu ka'bain fuhunab. What is below the ankle bones is an alpine. Your pants, your fold, your izah, whatever. The man had a kid excuse. He said, Ya Rasulullah, I'm not needed. You know, my knees come in. Not bow legged, not needed. They come in. I want to hide it. I don't want people to see it. It's a bad thing. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Inna Allah khalaqa kulla shay'in hasana. Allah created everything beautiful. Your legs like that, no problem. Raise up your soul. He had a legitimate reason. He didn't mention anything about arrogance. But what we do is, again, go far and look at you funny. How you gonna walk around in a, in a job with high water down? How? It's not trendy. It's not right. So that... Lifting of the pan is wajib, leaving the beard is wajib. To do either of those two is haram. That's for the salat now. Are these not, uh, what's the ramification? Of course you come home with Qiyam, everybody's going to need more. No one is going to be in a position where he did enough. Not even the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is going to be in a position where he did enough. As he told us in the authentic hadith, that none of your actions will cause you to enter into paradise. No one can do enough actions to please Allah and to thank Allah for his eyesight, for his good health, for all of the ni'mas that we have. Just one ni'mah. And the paradise is what no eyes have ever seen, no ears have ever heard, and no mind has ever contemplated. You can't do enough to get up in there. So everyone's going to wish, oh I did some more, oh I wish I did some more. And you can rest assured, if a person is like the physical with the sinning, then there's going to be some problem with the fuck. There's going to be some problem. Is it permissible for a person to pray wearing his or her pants? Yes, but when he makes sajda, his aura should become exposed, nor should it show the contours of his body. Some families reject the person if he is introduced to their daughter for marriage or, with their, or until their daughter finishes her education. Can you comment on this? It's up to the parents to determine the most benefit of the situation, to have some fuck about the issue. If it's better for the daughter to get married now, let her get married now and leave the education. If it's better for her to get educated, let her get educated. If you want to make the tofiq between the two, let her get married and continue her education. It's for her only eye to determine. They just have to see Allah. To, this is the last question, brothers and sisters. They have to see Allah Ta'ala in their determination. That's all. What if you have... All of the questions about uh, the Shia, we're going to go offline with them, inshallah. You could come to me and I'll discuss that baini wa bainaka, inshallah. Not because I'm scared of them. I don't want to create no problems. I don't know what these political ramifications are going to be. You have to control your own member to talk about what you want to talk about when you want to talk about it. 
You have to control your own situation. There's no difference between this and putting the dog out and breaking up the picture. No difference. You don't control your situation, take it easy. So the people who ask those questions about Shiite, if you Shiite and you want to discuss it, I know what's that. And if you just want to know, I know that there are people who may, they are on the borderline, they really don't know. I'm not going to say we'll talk about it later and I can't see you. No, we say, come on, if you're really looking for the truth, come on, we'll talk to you. When those people took over the American embassy in Tehran in 1979, that's when I started becoming interested in the Islam. Because what did they do? What did they do? The American embassy? The Shiite? What did they do? The first thing they did was they let the black marines go. And my aqid at that time was, look, if it's black, it's all right with me. If it's black, I support it. So when they let them black marines go and they said on the news, we don't have any problem with you black people in America. You black people are oppressed. They opened up my eyes. I said, what religion is that? What religion is that? But it's similar to, it's similar to the man who was making jihad and the people say, Ya Rasulullah, that man was really getting down, he was really... Rasulullah, we saw what happened, we saw he did, what he did. Rasulullah said, what? Inna Allah ala yansur dina hu bi rajman tajah. Allah will help his religion with an evil man. Elijah Muhammad. Elijah Muhammad told people that Allah Ta'ala had a wife by the name of Baby G. That was the Aqidah. Allah Ta'ala, how did He create the, earth, the world, the earth? He put a stick of dynamite in the moon, it blew up, and the earth came in with water. That there was a mad scientist with a big head in the Caucasus Mountains who created white people in a laboratory. That's His Aqidah. Wallahi, many of us came to Islam when we were affected by that evil. Wallahi, people who are on the signal right now, in spite of Elijah, not because of him. And we still struggle with the people who are Muslims, but they still have allegiance to that man. So we looked at those Shiites in 1979, and we said, MashaAllah. I said, yeah, I I'm interested. And that was the first whiff of Islam that I got. So if you're serious, Shiite, not Shiite, interested in Shiite, you just want to know, we'll talk to you offline. We have about five more questions and that's it, inshallah. I would just like for you to repeat what you said about dua, or about Allah being shy. Did I hear it wrong? Please clarify and elaborate if you can. There's another question similar to this. The hadith of the Prophet is, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, inna Allah, ya fi, you should sit over here somewhere with the hijab. You see how that brother was humble, Akhi? Well, I was in front of everybody, but it was a judgment call. How are we going to leave him over here, my brother? I want them what I want for myself. He didn't know, he didn't want any evil. How do you think he would have responded if you just went off on him? Yeah, Akhi, what are you doing? My wife over there. What? Yeah, Akhi? He wouldn't have responded, he got upset. He just humbled, he ate humble pie, he bit the bullet, he just got up, now he's shot. Jazakallah khair, Akhi. The hadith says Allah is hate, living. Allah is generous. He is shy for the servant to raise his hand. Ya Allah, I have this sickness, please cure me. Ya Allah, I want to get accepted to Medina to become a student of knowledge. Please make the way easy for me. Ya Allah, I want to marry that sister. You know I really want to marry. I think she's good for me and my religion and my akhirah. Please, uh, Ya Allah, please guide and protect my children. Allah, Allah, bring my husband back so we can be together. Ya Allah, and he makes that. When he raises his hands like that, Allah Ta'ala is shy not to answer his dua but Allah is shy in a way that befits his majesty Lisa commitly he shay wa huwa samirun basir nothing is like unto him and he is all hearing and all seeing lam yakul lahu qafwan ahad nothing is like unto Allah so he's shy in a way that befits his majesty he's not shy like the human being like the virgin girl like he's not shy like that He's shy in the way that befits his majesty. So, if he establishes it in the Quran or the Sunnah, we have to believe in it. We can't allow our imagination to run amok. So that's what we were saying in that hadith, that Allah is shy. Be careful though. Don't call yourself... Abu or Abdul Mustahi. That's not a name of Allah. Shyness is not a name of Allah. That's a characteristic of Allah. 
so we have to understand or I have to mention this as well is that Allah is not shy though, to tell you the truth إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يَسْتَحِي أَنْ يَدْرِبَ مَثَلًا مَا بَعُودَةً فَمَا فَوْقَهَا Allah is not shy إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يَسْتَحِي مِنَ الْحَقِ as that companion used to say to the Prophet when she wanted to ask him a personal question concerning the hygiene of the woman now some of us concerning these issues we want to leave our children to be educated sexually by the kuffar and when you talk about this in these kinds of forums people get itchy and, and, and shaky they let their children be educated sexually by the kuffar but in the masjid oh we can't talk about that so when the woman came to ask him about a personal issue dealing with the woman Islam is talking about the human experience there are things that happen to those women that they have to know about that happen between the men and the women we have to know about how to come, how not to come, when to come, when not to come how to clean and all that kind of stuff some of these cultures they want to put their hands in the, in the sand like the ostrich even though that's not a true cliche that's not true because I've been to Australia those ostriches don't do that the ostriches we will deal with you alright ostriches kick your head off your, off your shoulder I'm telling you that's not a true cliche so we recognize that you have to do it in the nice taste. Islam has high moral, high edda. Nisa'akum harthun lakum fa'tu harthakum anna shittum. Your women are tilt unto you. Come to your tilt how you choose. That's a nice way of saying it. Come to your tilt, your harth, the place where if you plant a seed, something's gonna grow. Don't go no other place. That's a nice way of talking. We don't just say anything anywhere, taking, not taking into consideration children and all that. Ali ibn Abi Talib said that, Kuntu rajulun mazza'in. I was a man who used to have this mazi. And he asked the man, go to the Prophet ﷺ and ask him, what should I do about this stuff? He couldn't go and ask the Prophet himself. How can he ask the Prophet something concerning his private and he's married to the man's daughter? Too shy. That's the etiquette and the adab of Al Islam. I visited my mother, we were watching the learning channel and they had these lions. My kids love lions. They were watching the lions and they came to the part of the lion mating. Wallahi, I was shy sitting there with my mother. It was uncomfortable. Yeah, they lions and it's just animals and it's a, but it was shy. How you can't be shy? So Allah is not shy to reveal what's the truth and to talk about those personal issues. Can you explain the idea about sitting in the gathering and someone to remember Allah and the Messenger? Does it apply to walimas and aqiqas or going to someone's house for dinner? The hadith that I believe the person is talking about, inshaAllah, is the hadith that the Prophet says, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, they are not a group of people who come together and they don't remember Allah and they don't send salutations upon the Prophet except that that sitting will come, will come your muqiyam as a chore, as a cause of their sorrow, your muqiyam. So people should say Bismillah, people should say some type of remembrance or dhikr. It is for every setting. You were a student here and you came here, you should remember Allah's name. Alright, these are the last questions right here, inshaAllah. Name some things that nullify or purify a person's sin. Accepting Islam purifies your sin, as the Prophet said in the long hadith of Amr ibn al af when he became a Muslim and he said, I want to accept Islam, Ya Rasulullah, and I want to accept Islam on the condition that Allah forgive me for what I did in Jahiliyyah. I did a lot of stuff. The Prophet Sallallahu said to him, Ala ta'lam anna al-Islama yujubbu ma kana qabluhu wa anna al-Hijrata tujubbu ma kana qabluha wa anna al-Hajj yujubbu ma kana qabluhu Don't you know that Al-Islam wipes away what went before it? And the hijrah, peace be with Allah, wipes away the sins that you did prior to it, and making hajj wipes away the sins. Hajj Juma and Hajj Juma and Ramadan and Ramadan, Salat and Salat and Juma and Juma and Ramadan and Ramadan and Hajj and Hajj, Kafaratun. All of those things wipe a person's sins away, along with dua to Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. If a woman is interested in a particular man, say in the setting that we are in right now, and she doesn't know anything about him but she is interested in him for potential marriage how does she go about pursuing this? that's the stuff she should try to get in touch with somebody who knows that person he has she has a good 
she has a good opinion about that person that's going to take care of the trust and not going to make her be the cause of some fitness, some kalam. You know, because you guys have to remember this hadith now. It's hard to practice some. Akhir and Tamai, you with me? The Prophet was telling me, Tola, if any of you wants to be successful in the things that you want to do, then keep quiet about them until you accomplish them. The very behind every ni'mah that Allah gave you is someone who's envious of you. Don't go out and broadcast everything that you want to do. Because when people hear it, some people make dua against you. And then if it doesn't work out, you've got to explain why it didn't happen. Mind your business. Just get involved with people who are umana. They can take care of the amana. And then, inshallah, Allah will give you the tawfiq or not. But if he doesn't, you don't have any explaining to do. So that person who's interested in another sister, he goes to the wali of that girl. Let them know about it. If the sister is interested in the brother, she goes to her wali or she goes to another person who she finds to be trustworthy. She, he can keep the amana. And sorry go about it, inshallah. And then if you guys do get married, inshallah, and I come back to Canada in the future, you should invite me over and say, we got married at that pub that you gave that time. So we owe you a dinner or something. <laughs> Since you have warned us about innovation, now how should we know where to get sahih sources from in this scene? And how should we start practicing the sunnah from the first stage? That's a beautiful question, all right. That's a question that causes the heart to become rare. As I said to you, brothers, and sisters, there are a lot of tapes that you can get. Start to purchase the tapes because riding to work and from work, having those walkmen, you can just get so much benefit. And on top of that, there are volumes of books that you can get that are authentic, that come from our brothers in England called Al Hidaya Bookstore. There's one sheikh in particular I would encourage all of you to get his book. His name is Hussein Al Awayasha. He has a book that's been translated into English called The Prayer and its Significance in Al Islam. He has another book called Sincerity. And the Shaykh has a way from the student of Shaykh Nasr al-Din. He has a way, wallahi, in Arabic. When you pick up his book and you get on the airplane, you can't put the book down. Each page unfolds with the turning of each page. It unfolds for you just, wallahi, when you read that man's book, just hang up your heart at the door. He has you just soaring all over the place with the righteous people. Hussein al awayasha all of those books from Al Hidayah, those books from the Call to Islam. Get the technical books, Sifat al Salat al Nabi, how to fast, how to make Hajj, all of those technical books. But let us also not forget our soul and our heart. The book, Craving Wealth and Status. It's a good book. All of those books, inshallah. Be in touch with those brothers like Tahdi, Abdul Awal, the brothers from Toronto who I'm very impressed with. Well, why those brothers came up here organized and ready. Toronto is setting a nice precedent here. You brothers have to get with the competition to be in a race, inshallah. Inshallah. I heard that it is a good idea to shake a brother's hand and touch your mustache. <laughs> Wallahi. In the salams, brothers and sisters, the salams is ibadah in al Islam. Give him salam. Saying assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, we should try to develop sincerity in saying it and mean it. If you really mean that, Akhi, stop making ghiba of me. Stop harming me. If you really saying to me assalamu alaikum, it's ibadah. On top of that, shaking hands is part of the salam. The Prophet said, if two Muslims come together and they shake hands, their sins fall off of them like the leaves fall off of the tree. Well, why the person who refuses to get close to his brother, he's the one who's losing. If you come together and you shake his hand, those sins that we started today, we made today, they get, they, they, they get off. But there's a way and a time. Do we have to make salah? You know when we used to go to church at the end of the church, when it was over, everyone would stand up and in the black churches, they were singing this terrible, sad, spiritual, they call it Negro spiritual. Well, why it, it just makes you so sad. And they were all do their feet like this in unison. And when you hear it, I used to say to myself, what kind of religion is this? This stuff you don't know what the preacher is talking about ever. He never has a subject you is connected to your life and the way they act it. You know, those people were revert. You know how your mother used to catch the Holy Ghost. She become possessed. Jesus Christ, the Holy Ghost, get into her. 
And she started jumping and throwing herself on the floor, kicking like a fish, bouncing all over the place. And then Monday in school, your friends will make fun of you, ridicule you. Ah, your mother, we came off. She caught the Holy Ghost in church. Huh? So me and my brother and my sisters, we used to say, Ma, don't embarrass us in the crib. Don't catch the Holy Ghost. <laughs> That's how we used to do all the time. So there were their ibadahs, whatever they want to do, anything, music, dance, going, anything. Not in Islam. So now, look at this. You shake hands and you touch their being. You shake hands and you say, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad. You shake hands and this is the big one. The people, every time they meet you, they do this to your thumb. When they shake hands, when they grab you, you just want to shake his hand like a man. They shake your hand and he grabs your thumb and he starts doing like this. Why? Because you may be khidr. And khidr doesn't have a thumb bone. That's what they believe. Khidr doesn't have a thumb bone. When you meet him and he doesn't have a thumb bone, this is khidr. Khurafat ya akhi. Who need a religion like that? So we have, wallahi, in al-Islam, the coming together and the pardon of the Muslim man and his brother, the Muslim woman and her brother from Islam. Those scholars used to write in the past how shaking hands with two hands is not from the Sunnah, it's from the ways of the A'ajim. They're not Muslim. And they wrote books like Al-Imam, Al-Qasim, that you shouldn't shake hands with two hands. And what about the people who come from certain parts? They are affected by the Hindu, Mahatma Gandhi. Humble. When they shake hands, they shake your hand like this. What kind of yahi? Be a man. Well, why I hate people who shake my hand like that? When I see people do that, I don't give them no love. When I see it coming, I don't, I don't even shake hands. I try to tell my how you going to shake. Then we have the other cocky brother. He sees you have a ring on your right hand. When he shakes, he puts it in the vice grip. And he hurts your finger. So some of us don't wear rings because of brothers like that. <laughs> yeah, Quran is all about fiqh and being easy in your religion. So there's nothing in the religion about shaking a hand and touching your mustache. Look, look at this one. I heard that it is a bigger to shake a brother's hand and to touch your stomach. <laughs> this is the last question here. When a woman wears her niqab all the way up covering her chin, when a woman wears a hijab all the way up covering her chin, they say that the way where their hijab, is it haram? That's what the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam showed us in the Sunnah and that's what we should do regardless of righteous people, irreligious people doing it. This is what you should be doing. I really want to just, we took a long time, that brother told me to go past the time, but it's no problem. Most of the people say, Jazakumullah Khaira. I want to end on this point, brothers and sisters, if we don't see each other or meet each other again, we want to encourage the Muslim brothers and the sisters to realize when you put your head on the pillow at night, you should be able to say to yourself, okay, what did I put forth today as far as Islam is concerned? What did I do? Am I just living this life like that and I'm just going day to day and I'm really not developing anything? So now all of you brothers and all of you sisters, you all have a piece of the puzzle. Everyone. Now what you have to do is identify your piece of the puzzle, bring it to the table, we all put the pieces together, and then we'll have the whole complete puzzle. Be easy with each other and learn and try to develop an ikhlas lillahi tabarak wa ta'ala. And we ask Allah ta'ala by His greatest name. That name if we ask Him by it, He gives that person what He's asking for. We ask Him to give us the tawfiq and the tadad and to make it easy for us and you in this dunya and in the akhira أقول قولي هذا وأستغفر الله لي ولكم ونسأل الله تعالى لنا ولكم التوفيق والسداد والسلام عليكم